friends, welcome back. I'm Mark Baker, and in today's broadcast, we're going to continue talking about the subject we've been looking at over the previous few programs. The question we're asking, is the Word of God enough? And today we're going to finish up with our series and looking at this. But our text is taken from Mark chapter 4, and we've been looking at some situations in the Word, looking at the Word of God. And one thing that we've seen as we've been going through this and looking at this is, you know, in Isaiah chapter 28, we looked at and we saw that it's precept upon precept, here little, there little. We are all in a state of growth. We're all growing into the faith of God that He has given us. If you look in Romans chapter 12 and verse 3, it talks about the fact that God has given to every man, every woman, the measure of faith. When you look at that word faith, we've already said it, it is the word histis in the Greek, which is P-I-S-T-I-S. This is a faith that is always received as a gift from God. It is not our natural human faith. It is not something we can contrive, something that we can work up, something that we can grow. But it is a measure of God's faith that He has given us to operate in. We all have the same measure of faith. We have all been given the measure of faith. The faith that we are called to operate in as a Christian is the faith that God operates in. We've already seen in Mark chapter 11 and verse 22, in response to Peter's question, they had traveled to Jerusalem and on the way back, Jesus had seen a fig tree. He was hungry, so he walked over to the fig tree because it had leaves. In that day, if the fig tree would have leaves, it should have fruit. So he saw the leaves on the fig tree. It was not the season for figs, and he was hungry. So he went over to pick some figs. No figs were present, so he cursed the fig tree. Why he did that, we don't know. The text doesn't tell us. The next day, they were traveling on the same road. As they passed by the tree, Peter remembered that Jesus had spoken that tree, and he, he saw that it was dead. It had dried up from the roots. So he exclaimed that. He said, Master, the fig tree you cursed. In response to that, Jesus gives us an explanation of faith. It starts in Mark chapter 11, verse 22. And Jesus said, have faith in God. That's what the modern translations read. Most modern translations read that. But if you look in the Greek, it does not say have faith in God. It says have faith in from God. Do you see the difference there? There's a big difference between having faith in something and having faith from something. We have faith in God, but the faith we operate is the faith from God. We believe in God, but we operate, we minister, we access His blessings with the faith from God. When we talk about faith, we're talking about a confidence, a trust. We looked over in Hebrews chapter 11, 1, and we saw that now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That word evidence in the Greek shows an assurance, a confidence. The problem we have as we step out in this faith is we have to develop, we have to grow into our measure of faith. It is not that we do not have enough faith. It is that we are not developed in our measure of faith. And that's the thing that tripped me up when I was much younger in the faith as I was growing and learning about the faith message. The way it was portrayed to me, the way I perceived the teachings I was sitting under, and the way so many ministers taught was that you had to grow your faith. We had seven steps for this, you know, seven steps for that victorious, how to grow into victorious faith, how to grow into mountain-moving faith. These are all good and well, but what they did was lead me into an almost endless cycle of struggle because I never felt that I had enough faith. When you realize that you have faith from God, God has given you a measure of His faith, that is a totally different story. There's a rest to that because it's not us needing to grow our faith. But the problem we have is 
is God just going to leave us to ourselves if we don't if we've not grown into this faith just to suffer and look at that? And that's what we've been looking at. Is the word of God enough? So let's look here in our text, and then we'll kind of jump in and see where the Holy Spirit takes us. And the big thing I want you to understand here is we serve a good God, a merciful God. It's it's really interesting because so many people today present him as this harsh, judgmental God. But you must not forget in John chapter 3 and verse 16, it says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. In Ephesians chapter 1, it talks about the fact that we were chosen by him to be adopted into his family. We were accepted by him from the foundation of the world. Religion tells us that we can disqualify ourselves from his love. But the Word of God tells us that we can do nothing because He chose us, He accepted us, and He adopted us before we were even conceived in our mother's womb. Psalms 139 tells us that He even developed a plan for us, in, uh, for our lives. You were put on this earth at this time for a purpose, and God has a purpose and plan for your life, and He wrote it out in His book. That's what it, we see in Psalms 139. You are valuable to God. You are precious to God. But is His Word enough? It is a matter of developing, growing our confidence in Him. How do we do that? We do that by walking with Him. Will we make mistakes? Yes, we will. Will we trip and fall? Yes, we will. The enemy will be standing at the doorway of our soul to bring thoughts of condemnation and thoughts of doubt and unbelief you know, that we just are not good enough, we're not worthy, we're not this or that when we, when we make mistakes. You can't stop those thoughts from coming. That's where relationship comes in. When you learn the Father's voice, you will be able to identify the source of the thoughts that are not from Him, because you will know His voice. When you spend time with a person, you get to know them. You get to know their character. And people say a lot of times, well, how do I protect myself from false teaching? Spend time with him. You see, in relationship, you learn his character. You develop this confidence. You develop in your ability to operate in his faith. Because faith requires a confidence, a confidence that's birthed in relationship. We live in a world that is full of distractions. It tries to pull our attention away from the world. The devil will use cares, concerns, worries, television shows, anything he can to distract you from the Father's Word. Because it is in the Father's Word that you learn to know the Father. And that's why it's so important. You're not going to go to hell if you watch TV or watch a movie or so on and so forth. But it's so important to set aside time. Just turn off everything and say, Holy Spirit, what do you want to talk about? You see, it is not a matter of following a formula or a set of steps to learn how to walk in the faith that he's given you, friend. It is a matter of just spending time with him. The more time you spend with a person, the more aware of their voice you will be. You know, Carol and I have been together for, you know, we're into our 18th year. People can come to me and make an accusation about about her. But I know her character. And I would know if that accusation was false without even having to come to her or ask a question. Why? Because I know her character. I know her integrity. I have confidence in her because I've spent time with her. You cannot develop in the faith of God without first spending time with him. And the thing is, he understands that we're flesh and blood. We're going to make mistakes. Look at this here in Mark chapter 4. And then we'll kind of jump in. It says, starting in verse 35, the same day when when the even was come, he said unto them, let us pass over to the other side. When they sent away the multitude, they took him, even as he was in the ship. There were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so it was now full. He was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. They awake him, 
Say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? He arose, rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? This was early in Jesus' ministry. Jesus ministered for anywhere from three to three and a half years. There are some historians that tell us that Jesus took upwards of 12 months to finalize his choice of the 12 disciples. These men had most likely, we don't have a complete time frame here, but most likely not been traveling with Jesus for very long. Some may be longer than others, since if it did take him a full year to, to choose all of his disciples. They had not yet developed their confidence, their trust in him. The storm had rose up. He had given them a word, and in that word, and that's the thing, is when you get a word from God, whether it's, you know, when the Holy Spirit quickens a word to you, there's an empowerment in that word that will enable you to do what it says. So these men were with Jesus in this boat. Some of them were professional fishermen, had probably grown up on these waters. The storm rose. You know, the, the boat is filling with water. He'd given them a word, said, let us go into the other side. But their fear, their anxiety, showed that they did not have confidence in that word. They came to him and woke him up, and it concerned them, like, why would he be sound asleep? Does, you know, we're putting our trust and our confidence in him. Isn't he concerned about the fact that we're drowning here, we're about to sink, and he's going to sleep through it all? And notice what he tells them. After he speaks to the storm, he said, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Why are you so filled with anxiety? Why do you have no confidence in me? Why do you lack trust in me? Do you not trust me when I told you that we would go to the other side? This indicates, you know, again, this was probably early in his ministry. This indicates that they had not yet spend a lot of time with him. There's another account which we looked at earlier in this series where most people focus in on the fact that Peter walked in the water. In that account, we see that Jesus told the disciples, to he constrained them and told them to get in the boat to go over to the other side. That situation occurred after this situation. It says that Jesus constrained them. He told them to get into the boat you know, in, in the evening, which was probably between three and five o'clock in the afternoon. But then it says he came to them in the fourth watch, walking on the water. A great storm had risen up. It, the winds were coming against them, so there was no possibility they could have been using their sail because they were going against the wind. Jesus comes to them in the fourth watch, which was probably somewhere between three and five a.m., in the morning. So they had most likely been out on this lake for 10 to 12 hours. If you look at it, it was, you know, they say that this was probably a two to three hour trip. What did Jesus find them doing? It would have been so easy for them to have turned that ship around and let the, the winds push them back to where they had come from and just wait out the storm. What was the difference? Now they had spent some time traveling with Jesus. Now they had spent some time watching Jesus. They had confidence in him. He had told them to go to the other side. They had seen him speak to the wind. But did they speak to the wind when they were in there? No. They were there toiling, working, probably rowing, trying to get to the other side. 10 to 12 hours for you know, somewhere between two to four hour trip. You would think they have gotten would have given up, but see, they had confidence in Jesus. The Bible does not promise us that we're not going to run into storms, friend. But in the Word of God, when the Holy Spirit quickens the Word to you, when you receive a Word from God, you have an empowerment. Jesus came to them walking on the very thing that looked like was going to sink their ship. Peter calls out to him and said, Lord, if it's really you, call me to come to you. And Jesus said, come. I mean, kind of didn't give Jesus a choice there when he said that, because what was Jesus supposed to say? But when Jesus said, come, 
That was an empowerment to walk on that water for Peter. It doesn't say the storm stopped. It didn't say the waves didn't stop beating against the ship. It didn't say the winds weren't continuing to be contrary against them as they were trying to go to the other side. I can't picture the disciples stopping to watch what's going on here. So they were most likely continuing trying to keep this ship pointed in the right direction, continuing to fight the wind as Peter gets out of the boat. Can you imagine what that must have been like for Peter? Can you imagine the confidence that he had developed over time spent with Jesus? He had developed in his measure of faith. He had confidence in Jesus' words as long as his eyes were fixated and looking at Jesus. Peter steps out of the boat. You have winds beating against the ship. These winds most likely were taller than him. And yet he steps out into that roiling steed that's, you know, the waves beating and pounding all around him. He steps out and he's able to walk on the water. Have you ever met somebody, friend, that's been able to walk on the water? Have you ever seen somebody walk on water? I mean, when we step in the water, we just, you know, you just go immediately under. As long as Peter was looking at Jesus, as long as Peter was considering the word that Jesus gave him, he was walking on that water. But then the account tells us that Peter began to look at the waves around him. You know, in the midst of that storm, he was safe as long as his attention was focused on the master. But when he began to look around him and consider the storm, he began to sink. I try to picture that. I mean, think about that. Can you imagine what it looks like to see somebody begin to sink? I've never seen it. Have you, friend? What would it have looked like to see him walking on the water and then begin to sink? I mean, when you step out in the water that's over your head, you don't begin to sink. You sink. Jesus grabbed him by the hand, which tells us that Peter was able to get out of the boat and walk almost to Jesus. And it was when he was within hand's reach where he could have just reached out to Jesus. So he was right to the master when his attention was diverted by the storm. There are no guarantees for you and I, friend, that we will not face storms as we're traveling through life. But as long as we keep our eyes on Jesus, as long as we keep our eyes on the Word, we will be safe in the midst of the storm. Jesus took Peter by the hand. He didn't berate him. He didn't scold him for looking at the waves around him. He just accepted Peter where Peter was and took him by the hand and led him back to the ship. And it says when in John's account, when they entered into the ship, immediately the ship was on the other side. It was translated to their side. The disciples acted in faith by continuing to keep the ship pointed into the storm, even though they were way past what it should have taken to get the other side. They continued to row. You can see the action, the confidence. They had a word from Jesus. This was so much different than what we saw in Mark chapter 4. And Jesus came to the midst of the storm, and immediately when he entered the boat with him, they were translated to our side. If you keep your eyes fixed on the word of God, it will bring you to the other side of that sickness. It will bring you to the other side of those financial difficulties. There will be times in the midst of it that you'll be questioning, you'll be struggling, you'll be trying to figure out. But it's just like we saw here in the account in Mark chapter 4. The Word of God was not enough for the disciples because they most likely had not spent enough time with Jesus. They didn't have confidence in Him. How do you grow in faith? It's not a matter of increasing your faith, as some say. And yes, there are scriptures in the Bible that talks about exceedingly growing faith. But if you look at it and take it apart in the original language, it's talking about growing into faith, developing in that measure of faith that you've been given. Friend, when we talk about walking by faith, we're not talking about walking by your natural human faith. 
We're talking about walking by the faith of God, the same faith that he used to create the universe, the same faith that Jesus operated in when he was on this earth ministering. Jesus did not operate as the Son of God. When he ministered, he ministered as a man anointed by the Spirit of God. He operated in the faith from God. We operate in the faith from God because we have been given the measure of faith. But that faith operates from relationship. And one thing I'm learning more and more and becoming more and more revelation to me is the fact that it is not a matter of increasing my faith or growing into my faith. It's increasing in my relationship with Him. I don't need to go through all kinds of hoops to receive something from God because He's already given me all things pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him, which is what Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 1, and verse 3. It's already been given. The question is, am I going to receive it? But am I able to receive it? In Mark chapter 4, we don't see any indication that Jesus got angry with the disciples. Yes, he said, how is it that you have no faith with me? You, you know, we've been together for a little while at this point. Obviously, the account where we see Peter walk on the water, they've been with him longer. They've developed more in relationship. People say, well, how, Brother Mark, how can I grow in faith? How can I grow my faith quicker? Spend more time with him? You'll find that the more time you spend one-on-one -on -one fellowshipping with Him, fellowshipping with the Word of God, the more confident you will become in Him because you will be listening to Him. You'll be observing Him. You'll be watching Him. Friend, God has a great plan for your life. God has given you the measure of faith. What the enemy will do when we make mistakes, because you're going to make mistakes. That's guaranteed. When you step out in faith, you're going to stumble. You're going to fall in your faith. The Holy Spirit will be right there with you to help you to get up and dust yourself off. You just keep pressing forward. But the enemy is going to come. Oh, you're just not good enough. Your faith's not strong enough. You're just this, this, and this. See, in the midst of the storm is not the time to develop relationship. When that boat was sinking and the water was filling that ship and the disciples came to Jesus, they were terrified. And they woke him up. Do you not care about us? They didn't wake him up and say, let's spend some time to get to know each other. You see, the time to build relationship is not when you're in the middle of a storm about to die. The time to build relationship is not when the doctor's report has come. The time to build a relationship is not when that foreclosure notice has showed up on your door. The time to build a relationship is now. But if you get into a storm and you do not know which way is up, he'll be right there with you just like he was with the disciples. They didn't have faith. They didn't have confidence in him. They weren't able to activate the measure of faith that they've been given. So Jesus spoke to the storm. I hear people say, well, you know, when the storm comes up, I live in Florida, we have hurricanes here. And I have people say, well, we'll just speak to the storm. But friend, look at the account. Jesus spoke to the storm as an act of mercy in response to the disciples' unbelief. When a miracle occurs in your life, Jesus is speaking to your storm as an act of mercy to your inability to operate in his faith. He is merciful, and he will meet you right where you're at. And that's why we don't need to worry about be condemning ourselves or beating ourselves up over making mistakes, because he understands. God loves you. He's a good God. He's not looking you know, for ways to keep us from receiving what has been provided in Christ Jesus. I mean, Jesus went to the cross, experienced a horrible death, descended into hell, suffered for three days and three nights to take the punishment that you and I deserve. 
He rose victorious with the keys of death, hell, and the grave. We have our victory in Him. He's not going to just leave us in the storm saying, I'm sorry, it's your problem because you don't have enough faith. Just like Jesus did not leave them in the storm to sink in that ship. Jesus spoke to the storm as an act of mercy in response to their unbelief. Jesus will speak to your storm, but there is a better way. We can purposely begin to develop our relationship with Him. We can purposely set aside each time each day to fellowship with Him, to fellowship with the Word, so that when the storm comes, we can walk above the storm, so that we can walk on the water just as Jesus and the Peter did, whether it's the waters of sickness, you know, whatever that storm may be, the water, you know, financial difficulties, whatever the storm might be. But remember the words of Isaiah, precept upon precept, here they're little, there little. It's a growth process. As you spend time with Him, your confidence will grow and you'll see your victories coming more and more often. At first, it sometimes will feel like nothing is working, but keep setting aside that time. Keep listening, keep fellowshipping, and you will find the victories coming more and more often. You will find yourself soaring above those storm clouds. Yes, they'll come, but victory will come too. But wherever you're at right now, don't let the enemy condemn you because we serve a good God. And in Hebrews chapter 9, it says that Jesus is the high priest of our good God, good things. Friend, our time is up today. Remember, Carol and I love you. We're praying for you. Please send us an email at prayer at Media Ministry. Let us know if there's anything we can stand with you in prayer. We love you. And just let me remind you once again, you can live life to the fullest, walking by the faith of the Son of God.